Hello, my name is Marie Paris and welcome to part two of Property Summit, where we're going to be talking about looking forward to 2021. We had previously spoken about what we have done in 2020. On my left, we have Richard Bush, John Howard, and on my right, we have Tony Gimple, Nicholas Warwick, and Paul Mahoney on live link from Australia. So looking ahead for 2021, out of adversity comes opportunities. So Nicholas, I'm gonna start with yourself. What do you think is going to be the main property opportunities and strategies of 2021? Yeah, good question. I'm sure there's there's quite a few, and I think it depends on your own experience, what you consider to be an opportunity. Um, our primary business is property development um, and specifically conversions. So we're looking forward to seeing some good new fresh stock come to the market um, in a kind of unfortunate way. There will probably be more offices available, some out of, out of the edge of the town centre retail that would be appropriate for residential conversion um, and quite a lot of fresh stock. You know, we've, we've had the permitted development rights um, in for a good few years now and that's meant that a lot of the existing offices the, the the really ones ripe for conversion have already been snapped up and developed so actually stocks are kind of a little bit low on the conversion side um, and it's got quite heated in recent months um, as that stock has you know uh, gone away basically it's been it's been snapped up so you know what we're looking at now is hoping for more lovely lush stock coming to the market that's ripe for residential conversion so that's what what I'm looking out for Okay, what do you see one of the strategies generally for 2021? Um, I mean, I think the, the fundamental strategies can stay the same. I mean, it depends what, you're, what, what market you're in. You'll know your market. Um, and I'm not going to change our strategy. You know, we feel we've got an excellent strategy. We build um, equity into our buildings. Being property developers, we're adding value. I think key to any strategy is adding value. So I'm going to continue to do that by developing old rundown buildings, offices, uh, commercial buildings into lovely new apartments, adding value. And that, that value will give you more buffer. You know, if the markets do have a little dip um, that some people are predicting, I you know, think there will be a little dip, but I think we've got a really strong year ahead. So, you know, it remains to be seen how unemployment affects things. But What sort of dip do you think that we'll have? Well, I think it's, it's going to be regional dips, personally. I think overall, my, my gut feeling is the sort of average price in the UK and in strong areas, you know, areas with good transport, good employment, um, and a diverse um, business um, er, business areas, those will do well and, and increase the most. But I think the average is going to go up s slow but sure. I don't think we're seeing a boom, and I don't think we're seeing a massive overall dip. But I think there will be regional dips um, okay. where there's specific industries um, that have been hit by COVID. So nothing as massive as 30, 40 percent as what? No, I don't believe so at all. Okay. Not at all. Not at all. <coughs> John, um, what do you think? Well, um, thank you for um, uh, asking me next because I, I'm going to take Nicholas to task a little bit in what he said. Do you honestly believe, Nicholas, that the property market in the UK will not have any downturns in any areas? No, next year. no, definitely there will be regional downturns. Okay. And I was being probably specific to short term market, you know, 2021, which sort of is the theme of today of this show. Yes, no, it is. Yeah. Um, and I think it's going to take a bit longer for any recession to kick in overall as an average kind of price. You don't think when the Chancellor of Exchequer says what he said, that we haven't even started the recession yet? Well, exactly. It's not going to start in... Uh, First part of 2021. I think, he meant like, I think he meant the other day. The other day. Hmm. I mean, I've seen, I've been survived three property recessions, and this is very different. I accept that to to any others that I've been involved in. Yeah. How does it differ? See, John? How does it differ? It differs because in the past, uh, and, and Tony and, and Richard will bail me out. I'm sure. I mean, in the past, there's, you know, there's been an um, economic disaster. Uh, it, or which there is this time, to be fair as well, but there's been, this time there, there's no lack of lending, there's no lack of borrowing, which I think has a big effect. Secondly, this time round, there are so many um, people that want to get into the property market, mm. uh, and that's the difference between when I started 40 years ago and now, is that the, the, the demand and the interest in <coughs> property, you know, that's why we've, we've got property summits. Um, 
there's so much interest and, and demand, and it's very important that those people get the right education and the right advice, depending on what they want to do. Um, it is, so it is different. It is very different. But what I've seen the market drop 30, 35, 40 percent. And how long did it take to recover after that? It takes probably three years to recover. Some areas still haven't recover. recovered. It, you know. And some, in some areas, <coughs> yeah. you could argue, I mean, just, yeah. you know, we haven't Since got to go back too long. Yeah. 2008, 2009, I've got properties that aren't worth as much as they were yeah. in 2007 now, yeah. still. Would you and argue, I'm meant to know what I'm doing. Would you argue as a general <laughs> rule that, you know, your comment about sort of they've lent 300 billion, that's got to have an effect? Got to have know? an effect, doesn't it? Isn't the chancellor? Isn't the government just going to, you know, hide that away with well, inflation? I, I, you know, is that going to yeah. help property investors? So yeah. true assets, they're printing I, I, money. Yeah. Massive inflation. Isn't yeah. that going to help property investors? Well, that I, have got I assets? would agree with you this time round. They're not going to do what they did in 2009 onwards to 2017 austerity. Then I can't see them doing that. I think they've learned that, that really that was very tough. And I think um, the present Tory party are very different to the one before. So I, I, I think you're right. I think it's going to be spread over a much longer period of time. And maybe, you know, maybe certainly someone of my age may, may not need to worry about it. You need to worry about it. And, uh, and, and Paul does there. Richard, is interest rates going to go up, do you think? I mean, they're going to have to at some point, aren't they? And that's going to be <coughs> a real cruncher for a lot of people. I don't, personally, I don't think they will for a few years. I mean, they're globally low and Globally, the issue is pretty well the same, and therefore I imagine they'll keep them low globally so that we all recover at the same, at the same rate. One of the things I think is different now to 2008 9 is or that 1990 or 1986. All the other, yeah. going back to your first recession in the 30s, Thank the, you. The, the difference is this is it happened very quickly, and there's potential for the recovery to be very quick. Um, and that's what they're hoping, isn't it? That it's going to be a sort of V shaped recession rather than a u-shaped recession and i personally think that that is what will happen the, the businesses that are suffering at the moment are low capital businesses you know their shops their their, their yes. restaurants their yep. cafes and they will recover and they will recover i think quite quickly yes so i personally don't see that um the reaction to this is going to be interest rates the reaction is going to be a slow continued investment and we will recover and I think we'll recover quite quickly. There will be unemployment but I think it will come back quite quickly. But cash is king so if you don't <coughs> have cash to circulate and you know you can't sort of deal with the debts that you have you're eventually going to go under though aren't you? As a business or as a country? As a business. Oh, of course yeah that, that, that's true um, but you know businesses have had support that they've never had before. But it's you know, got to be paid back. It's got to be paid back, but it's, but the time to pay back is quite long, and the interest rate on it is quite low. Mm. So actually, I think a lot of those businesses, some of them won't recover. So, so Richard, I mean, you've survived a few recessions like me. So do you, and as Tony has, do we, the more experienced one of us in terms of age, you know, we're used to interest rates of 10 or 12, 15% yeah. Yeah. and yeah. all sorts of nasty things that happen. Yeah. And you clearly don't think this time round it's going to be like that. No. No. no, and I have to say, I, I, I'm, I, I'm now thinking less so than I did early on in the year that actually next year is going to be okay. Yeah. I can't see any increases in values, and I think London is very vulnerable. Yeah. Very vulnerable. Paul, let me bring you in on that. What, what do you say? Yeah. Look, again, I think, I think your take on this and, and how sort of yeah, bullish or bearish you're going to be about it depends on what your strategy is. And and I think, you know, I can see why John has the take that he has because John is very much, uh, you know, John does deals. He's usually in and out of something within, I wouldn't, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, John, but, you know, a few months to a couple of years, you try to get in and out of a deal. Usually, I hope so. unless you keep <laughs> Not <it>. always. <laughs> now, if that's, if that's your strategy, you need to be pretty confident in that six to 18 month period. And if things go wrong, you lose your shirt. But what we do as a business is much more mid to long term. And therefore, it really doesn't matter. All of this doesn't really matter when we're talking mid to long term. You know, Brexit, COVID, they're short term speed bumps. And, you know, I, I, I quite often get asked, can, can you make money in, in the short term in a market like this? And absolutely you can. But it comes down to the individual properties in individual locations where you are buying, because some areas will do really well 
even in a bad market because of specific driving factors to that property and location, such as new infrastructure, you know, gentrification, all sorts of things that can happen in locations, even if the overall UK property market is going backwards. And I think that's what's a little bit silly is you quite often hear people commenting on, well, you know, what's, what percentage is it going to go up and down by this year, the overall market? Because we don't invest in the overall market. You know, we invest in, most of us anyway, individual properties and individual locations. Um, and if you pick those really well, you can still do well. Um, and, and therefore, you know, I got asked yesterday, for example, by a client, you know, these numbers that you've run for me, they don't seem to account for any COVID or Brexit dip. And I said, well, well, no, that's not true. They do because we've run them at 5% growth, projected 5% growth per annum on average over a 10 year period. So even if there is a dip, which no one knows if there's going to be or there isn't, but if there is, let's say there's a 5% dip next year, you'll make that up over the next three to five years and some. So I suppose from a buy to let perspective, good properties in good areas with good driving factors and, and a focus on rentability in the short term. So long as you've got a tenant, you're safe. You know, the conversation around debt and, 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 and the cost of that debt increasing, we need to remember we're in a historically low interest rate environment. Debt's never been so cheap as it is now. So even if the cost of that debt doubles, historically, that's still a low yeah. you know, interest rate but, scenario. So yeah. it's I mean, still that, quite affordable. It is. That, you, what you're saying, Paul, is absolutely right for, for, for your type of investor. For buy to let. For the buy to let type of investor. I don't disagree with that. Bit boring, bit boring, but I, I don't disagree. We've said this on many occasions. Uh, but for, for sort of the sort of deals that I do where, you know, um, I'm looking now for part finished developments, which I've just bought in Birmingham. Uh, other sites that are part finished where the bank have gone bankrupt and, and by the way one or two small banks are going bankrupt already uh, and some developers are going bankrupt so you know this is this is my jungle if you like and this is this is where you know my eyes light up because I can make more money uh, myself and my investors in a difficult market than I can in a hot market because in a hot market anyone can do it anyone can do it it's easy in a difficult market, a challenging market, the experience that I've got and, and other people around this table have got comes to a fore. help let's say a investor who's perhaps bought some properties went on to develop a few flats probably four flats in a house they now have some land and they're thinking about building on there what sort of advice would you actually give them because I know that you have got lots of connections and your funding is really great not other people have that sort of access to that so what sort of advice would you give to somebody like that. Before you answer that, John, can we stop using the word investor? Okay. Uh, what would you like me to say? Well, we're, we're running property businesses. Uh, John's a property developer. It's his full-time job. Mm -hmm. Richard you know, is in fun, effectively funding businesses. Nick is you know, developer, landlord. You know, he's running a business. He's not just investing in it. I think you're going on semantics a bit. For no, me, no, 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 no. For, no, for no, me, it, I have to say, though, you know, if you're doing mm. buy to let, whatever, a business, what is a business? A business is solving a problem for a profit. Yes. So if I'm using that that term, but what, what's your point, Tony, the, that you I, want to make? I, I think the, the point is, if we are, as an industry, you know, moaning about how we get treated, particularly by various exchequers, you know, for tax purposes, treating us as passive, lazy investors, living off other people's rents. Mm -hmm. If we keep using that term investor, as opposed to professional property businesses, we, then we can't expect to be treated as a business or to be taxed as businesses. The two things aren't mutually exclusive. You can be an investor 
and the business at the same time. Yes, I'm, correct. I'm comfortable yeah. with the word. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it, 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 at the end of the day, you know, when we come out of, when and we will come out of COVID, and there has been a reset, you know, people have realised what's important to them as individuals. Hence, why you know we've seen a lot of pickup. There's a lot more humanity out there than there ever was. You know, and, and the beauty about living in a broadly liberal democracy is we can influence the political agenda and to a degree we can influence how we're taxed. So yes, one can invest in a business, you know, but being in a business as, as opposed to just chucking money at stocks and shares are two very different things. You know? And, our, and our, our constituency, you know, our audience, yes, there will be some really passive investors you know, balance and diversification. But the vast majority, I think, of the people we talk to, whether it's buy to let, whether it's development, what have you, want to, you know, build a long term business for themselves, you know, for their families, for the next generation. I think that's right, Tony. But but and what I would always and we always say this, you know, whether you're a, a more passive investor with with Paul saying on um, buy to let over the next 20, 25 years or whatever. It is a business. It is a business, and <clears throat> you can lose money if you don't do it right. You know, it, it, this isn't for the faint-hearted. None of it's for the faint-hearted. And it, in terms of property developing, it's all about risk and reward. Risk and reward. How much risk are you willing to take? How you can how you can uh, negate that risk by knowing by having the experience to to know to set the deal up like like we said last show set the deal up right in the first place to avoid the pitfalls that can happen um, and, and, and anticipate uh, what the market is likely to do and make sure that you are an out before you have an in. I want at least two, if not three outs at the moment mm. before I have an in because I don't know what the market's going to do. So I want to make, I want to have a bigger margin than I would normally have. Right. Um, I want, and I want to have at least two, possibly three outs before I'm in. And if I can do that, and I know what the worst scenario will be, then I'm happy to still trade in this market. But it's a dangerous game to be trading in a market that you don't know where the bottom is. Dangerous. And it's really only for the experienced people to be involved in it, in my view, when you're trading and developing. And I see, the biggest worry I see with people who I speak to, is they have no fear. They see no danger. Right. And that scares me and worries me. So I've got these joint venture people come to me now, people who want me to invest in their deals, which is something we just started doing. And I see no fear, no danger. They see no danger. That puts you off them. And that Does worries it? me. It worries me. There is danger everywhere. And you should be fearful. And they're not. And that's dangerous. Does that not just come with experience, though? You can argue that comes with experience, but people think, because we're property developers or investors, developers, whatever you want to call us, uh, you know, we're, we take big risks. We don't take big, big risks at all. Paul takes no risk at all in his game. We take some risk. We should take Paul's some risk. He's, he's sitting happy in Australia. So, but, our, but the risks we take are controlled risks. And, and the odds are stacked up in our favour. We're not, we're not blindfold walking across the road, bang. That's not going to happen because we're organised, we're disciplined, and we know what we're doing. The key thing John is saying there is about having a plan A and a plan B and a plan C Absolutely. before you go ahead. And, and in a difficult uh, market we're coming yeah, into, yeah. very important. Be <coughs> cautious. Yeah. Okay. I think it's important just to provide a little bit of clarity there, John. There's definitely still a little bit of risk in buy to let property investment. Um, and people need to be aware of that too. So to say there's no risk in it is the wrong thing to say. But I get we, you know, there's a bit of exaggeration in, in the, the terminology you use there. So, Tony, I read something recently, I think, that you had written, and it's following on from what you said previously that you do feel that there should be some sort of landlord rebellion standing up to, to the government. Um, were you serious yeah. about that? No, I, I am serious about that. You know, I mean, because we do seem as though we're getting a bit of a, a raw deal, especially the, the majority of investors, business people, 
who have, you know, two, three properties, yeah. four properties, whatever. The private rent, rental sector provides a massive amount of homes for people who either need to rent or want to rent. Everything from people who are, uh, are, who are running um, social businesses, you know, halfway houses, uh, people dealing with uh, refugees, people who, 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 who run properties, those who have you know, fall, fallen out of the net so, somehow, through to co-living, HMOs, student accommodation. Um, and why should we be treated as you know, being, you know, living off somebody else's fat. We're not. You know, if, if you look at how much you know, is put in to property businesses, how much risk is taken, how much revenue, direct and indirect, mm -hmm. is, is collected, suddenly, you know, to treat us as some kind of pariahs and parasites is wrong. And it's about time the sector, you know, had you know one one real voice and stop being passive about how it's treated. I mean, in essence, you know, if, if you're in buy-to-let, you're, you're, you're taxed on your turnover. Yeah. Not on your profits. Which is totally unfair. It's totally unfair. It is the only business Absolutely. in the world yeah, to, to be treated like But Tony, you're not contradicting yourself. On the one hand, you're saying that if you're a property investor, you should treat it as a business and run it as a business. Business, yeah. And the tax changes were, were to say that if you own a property, you, you should run it as a business and pay tax like a business would. But he yeah. doesn't make the rules. No, 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 he doesn't. <coughs> no, he doesn't make the rules. But I, I mean, I've, I've and again, I've, I've, I've had a, some. I won't say it's fan mail about this because it wasn't fan mail, um, because I've said, look, at the end of the day, I cannot see what's wrong with the government wanting every, to be regulated and, yeah. and yeah. being put in a company because that way. Some people have abused the system. That's mm. the truth. Mm. They've abused it by not paying the tax they should do, whether it's a capital gain on a second home or third or fourth home when they've sold them, or, or not paid the tax on rent. Yeah. So, the, so I mean, to, to change that was to the, the, the government's policy is to have an, in a limited company any return. That way, they know what everyone's doing. Now, I'm pleased about that because I pay a lot of tax every year. I'm pleased about you that. You do a lot of deals. Yeah. Well. <laughs> Hopefully, but I, you know, I'm pleased about that because it puts everyone on the same basis that the professionals are already on. No, it doesn't, John. Does well, it? I disagree. With no, it doesn't because it, it, if it, you can't it, afford that advice, well, it, then it, you're not on a level playing field. You could argue. Should you be having? Should you, if you own well, property, you should be able to that, that. pay for the pay the advice. To be honest, oh, with you. I think that's a little bit harsh. Well, if you're running a business, right. you should be paying tax on exactly. your. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, but they it. don't treat them the same way. John is trading in business, so he's fully treated as a trading business, particularly when it comes to inheritance tax. He gets business relief. I've also got companies that, 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 that just hold, that hold stock. Right, I, I, yeah. Yeah, but, you, 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 but you've got a land bank, which again is, yeah. is similarly treated. If all your limited company is doing, or in the main, is collecting rents for 12 months or more, on the one hand, you're treated as a a company, yeah? yep. so you pay corporation tax, yep. NI and all the rest of it, dividend tax. But when it comes to inheritance tax, you're treated as owning an investment business and you do not get business relief. So you're either a proper business, a proper company, and get treated exactly the same way as the corner shop, TV. And Tony, isn't that what you should be campaigning for though, is that, is that the businesses are treated like Equal, businesses absolutely. equally, absolutely. Not, not that we go back that is, to a That is the campaign. Yeah. And that, I would support that's the that campaign, campaign yeah. 100%. Absolutely. Absolutely. absolutely right. Yeah. 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 There has absolutely to be, right. yeah. Yeah, as, as, as opposed level to the way playing field, level absolutely. playing field, yeah. as opposed yeah. to the bear trap that George Osborne yes. set up, yes. yeah, which is a very good way if, if the current Chancellor actually wants to, yeah. Yeah, and doesn't need us to tell him that we're not putting ideas in his head, he's smarter than a lot of us combined. Yes, he is.
think things are going to affect the domestic market going forward then? Next, I'm going to talk a little bit beyond the next 12 months. Okay. Where would well, it be? Well, I'm slightly biased because I've got some estate agencies as well. Um, I see the domestic market being okay. I see it's two different markets. I see the domestic market where if you want to move home, yeah. move home. If you already own a home, actually buying a more expensive home at a discount, you're better off. So, and if you haven't got a home and it's where you want to live, you know, your home isn't a business. Your home is where you want to live and relax and enjoy yourself. And actually, I don't think it makes any difference at all going forward domestically. And I think the domestic market will be okay. First time buyers, the government are uh, obsessed rightly so, with getting people on the housing ladder because they know that if someone owns their own house, they're far more likely to vote Tory than they are Labour. That's what it's about. Do you see statutes being extended beyond I see, the 31st I see of Wishy doing us all a favour and uh, may change it slightly, but I don't think that they'll get rid of the holiday. I, I believe that will stay in place in some shape or form. I think they're going to bring in a 95% 95, 95 mortgage for not just first-time buyers, I think they're going to subsidise it in some way. Nationwide now, I think, are now doing 90% mortgages again. So I see the domestic market being okay. Not just for first-time buyers as well. Not just for first-time well, buyers. So, I'm, so I've letters. been told. Yeah, we'll see. I, Maybe I'm wrong. I don't we'll see. see. That. I don't see that. But no. I hope I see that. Owner occupiers. Um, but I don't think be in buy to let. No, not, not invited. Not invited. No. All right. You mean so, second home? I mean, yeah. Okay. So, so what I'm, yeah, for, uh, I mean, home ownership, home. People moving to. Yeah, moving to a second home, we'll be able to get a 95% mortgage. <coughs> yeah, yeah. The, the dealing market, if you want investment, dealing, whatever you want to call it, that's very, very different. There's people out there paying 15, 18% interest mm. on property deals. It's not sustainable. I couldn't do that. It's not sustainable. So, that market, you only need it to slow down slightly. And like we said before, you know, the paper, we've been papering over the cracks because the ones who were in trouble, they've just been pushed on a further six months because they've had loans and because the market's been a bit better than it should have been and so on. But there will be problems going forward for some developers, especially the inexperienced ones who have who have said, oh, well, you know, have been bullish about the, 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 uh, the, the values they think they're going to get, and all the rest of it, there will be some carnage out there. There will be some carnage. And some of us, hopefully, will be able to take advantage of that. Now, some people watching the show will say, well, that's very harsh and unfair. But most people make property, money out of property, out of someone else's problem. You need to be able to solve that problem for them <coughs> or for the bank. Mm. That's the truth, especially, let, at, especially at auction. Let me turn it a slightly different way in terms of what you're saying. Let's say that you are that developer that's having some problems. Yep. What could they do financially? How could they save that development for themselves, for them, for their families? What could they do? What would you on, advise? <clears throat> it depends on their situation, you know, what's causing the problem. I mean, it's, there's no single solution, but there normally is a solution. And one of the things that Paul mentioned, the difference between him and John, is that John gets in and out and Paul is there for the longer term. And the obvious solution for many developers is rather than selling is to look to hold on to them if there's still enough um, value in the development to be able to refinance it and, and let it and not sell it. Um, but every single situation is, is different. There's not a single, you know, no, I, I I, not even John could come up with a single rule that's right for every developer. Well, no. I'd, I'd like so, to see, a, uh, on that note, building them and letting them for developers. If they are trying to push this to institutional grade investors yeah. and bigger developers, yeah. I'd like to see a more um, flexible mortgage for an end yeah. refi so you can get a little bit more of that value out. Yeah. Because it's often capped at, you know, with the main... High street banks, 60, 65 yep. percent. If you go to some more niche banks, now. maybe 70 percent. But, but, but yeah. Nicholas, you've that been very successful over the years doing just that with your micro kind, units and kind. everything else. You know, and that's a market. And that's that getting harder now because they brought the minimum size yeah. requirements in. Yeah. So, maximising the asset is getting harder, and the loans are getting harder loan yeah. to value as well. So well, then it's like refunding. Yeah. You know, what I would would say is, for some people, if they're in trouble, the best things to do. Is don't certainly don't bury your head in the sand. Go and see the lender. Talk to them early when you know there may be a problem. Not uh, not late when it's all happened. I think Richard would agree with that. Go and speak to them. Talk to them. 
discuss it. Because the worst thing anyone can do is bury your head in the sand because it doesn't get any better. Nicholas, is Bill to Rent going to be the thing that's really going to take off? I mean, do all customers want to live in small units and on top of one another? Well, I'm glad you asked me that question because um, I felt we weren't done on Bill to Let. I think it's a really good subject. And I think I it's a you would. big way the market's going. Um, you know, I think micro units are different to build to let you know build to let it can be any size apartment so that's just that was just a small or houses yeah it could, it could be anything it's just got to make sense that you can add enough value to refinance out most or all of your money so that you can keep building you know without constantly you know draining other people's capital or raising you know equity capital to continue business that's not going to work um so i think you know it is a big part of the sector um i think it's going to get bigger getting bigger. Um, I've seen huge tower blocks going up in Reading in lots of other towns in the southeast where the developers are keeping them and, and letting them out. And they're building tower blocks to keep. Um, it's a huge part and of the market. And that's of course a very safe, yeah. uh, if you can do it, that's a super safe investment. Yeah. Yeah. If you can do that, yeah. if you can get, my issue is unless the, unless, and you've managed to do this on numerous occasions, I know, but unless you've got some e decent equity in the deal, and it all comes down to one thing in the end, all, all of us are in the Cash. same boat. The deal, if the deal is right, if you buy it right, there's lots of options, and if you get into trouble, you can get out of trouble. Mm. But the, you have to buy it right in the first place. If you pay too much for anything, yeah. just because a bank values it at what you want them to, doesn't mean it's a good deal. Yeah. And that's the issue, you need yeah. to know that, that there is real value. And my three golden rules are, one, you should be able to sell it immediately as you bought it at a profit without doing anything. Because you should be buying it at a discount. Right. And then the other two are, you should be able to buy it, refurbish it, and sell it at a profit, and buy it, refurbish it, and let it, which is Nicholas's great trick, and get most of your cash back and move on. If you can't do those three things, ask yourself on every deal, can I do those three things? If I can't, I don't do the deal. And if I've got joint venture partners and they come to me, and they can't answer those three questions, I'm not lending them or giving them any of my money. And I, th I think key to just add to that last point of John's there, the letting of it, the letting side has multiple exits as well. You know, we could be talking yeah, about absolutely. social market letting. Yeah. Uh, that's really hot Sell it as moment. an investment at the end. Sell it as a fully yep. tenanted investment. Yep. Um, professionals, students, you know, whoever your, your target market is, if you design that building to be able to be let to multiple different options. And we always spec ours up to, you know, a good high professional spec so that we could actually let to the higher end of the market, you know, corporate, so, you know, small uh, Airbnbs and, and, and the high end corporate let stuff, or we can let it to social. Yeah, it's over spec for social, but we've got all options. What are the, the key factors in your business on the build to rent side that makes you successful? Um, look, I, I think first off, we, 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 we do a lot of due diligence on making sure we are ticking all of the right boxes from a from a fundamental perspective that comes down to, you know, investing in the right location with all the right driving factors that give us confidence in that location, moving in the right direction. Um, you're buying the right properties um, off the right people uh, and ticking all the, all the boxes there that mitigate risks as much as possible. Um, we take much more of a um, sort of financial advisory, financial planning approach to property than most others. So, you know, um, the, the, th the difficulty that I've found in the property industry, especially for beginners, is finding the right people to, to rely upon as to what you should be buying. Because, you know, you can't go and talk with your local localist. Well, you can. You, but if you go and talk with your local estate agent, they've got 10 properties on their book. They're going to try to sell you one of those 10 properties. What, and even if they're a really good guy and they say, look, I haven't got anything that suits you. And they send you off on your way down to the next local estate agent. Um, so that can be difficult, you know, for people that are starting out. Um, you know, so that we're obviously not about that. We don't have a book or a list. So it's all about sort of matching the best of what's available for the individual. And I think that's something that can be difficult to do on, on your own, when, when, especially when you're just starting out. Okay, fine. Can I pick up something Nick <coughs> mentioned? Because it's also related to what John was talking about. In that um, one of the challenges that people are facing this year, because lenders have reduced how much they're willing to lend, is to refinance a development once it's finished and then to let it out. 
And so you were saying that, that typically you would have been able to get 75% loan to value on the exit finance. Now you're down at 60%. Um, there are other options. So there are companies like ours and alternative sources of finance that are now available, that weren't available before, that you can use to fill the gap between what lenders are willing to lend, typically at good rates at the moment because they're low loan to value, with additional finance from investors who will share in the profit and share in the income. So they're kind of sharing the risk as well. So that, that's one of the differences, that, you know, 10 years ago, we didn't have that option yeah. in the last True. recession, whereas those options are available because of alternative It's kind finance. of mezzanine, almost a like mezzanine, mezzanine, ongoing or, yeah, investment equity. mezzanine yeah. financing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and, and what I would say is, in the last 10 or 15 years, certainly, the amount of these bridging companies, or bridging type companies, that are, there are hundreds of them. I mean, in the old days, yeah. there was like two bridging companies you could go to 30 yeah. years ago, yeah. and you only went to them at, you know, at the very last, last resort when someone hasn't completed when they should have done or something like that. Yeah. Now, um, there's many, many of these banks charging a lot of interest. And the one thing I would say, please don't use them like a clearing bank, like the old fashioned banks were. They're not, they're expensive. Right. And you need to know when you can exit them before you start signing up loans. Don't try and treat them like a, a, a normal bank, because they're not, and they're very expensive. And if you go over the, the criteria, the, the time criteria, they get even more expensive. Yeah. yeah, and some of them can be very ruthless anyhow, aren't they? Well, <laughs> it's secondary lending, yeah. and you know, it's buyer beware. going to be the telltale signs for going forward in 2021 that we can see that things are starting to move in the right direction? Who wants to lead oh, with that? I'll, I'll lead with that one. Okay. okay. So there, people are beginning to realise that there is a vaccine on, on the horizon. Mm -hmm. yeah. there, it's been flagged that come Easter, yeah, we should be able to get back to some degree of normality. There'll be people realising that any tax changes won't necessarily come in 2021, but they may come in 22 or 23. Uh, people have got this drive to get back to normality or a new normality. They still want to own their own homes. They still want to be self-sufficient that, the, I mean, then the market is is going to recover. It always does. It's just a question of, you time. know, when and time. Yeah. Yeah, th there's been a hell of a lot of doom and gloom, and it's been scary. You know, the, the dystopian society you know, brought about by some non-man-made or man-made... You know, China-made. China-made. <coughs> <laughs> Take the tinfoil off your head, Nick. I know you're into the conspiracy stuff. No, sorry. <laughs> All joking aside. Yeah, stuff happens. You know, we are, at the end of the day, only human. We've survived. We'll continue to survive until the next meteor sets up, you know, the extinction event going. And people now have actually a better heart and they're just going to get on with it. You know, so are there any real telltale signs? Yes and no. Yeah, I think look look into the risks, look into who you're going to get into business with, particularly if it's individuals, where's your exit route, what happens if, if, if they have a life-changing event, don't sweat it, get on with life and be a good human and that's where you'll see the signs coming through. I just wonder if we can say that you know, everything's going to be all right when be. we're in a situation that none of us have ever experienced before. Well, I do. just wonder how you say that with well, so, much that clarity, with so much clarity, really. <laughs> well, what, 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 what do you say, no. Richard? Well, I, I think it depends well, what the question, whether the question is about um, the economy as a whole or about the property What market? are going to be the telltale signs? So, what so are so going to be <laughs> the green shoots that we're going to know, oh, we're on the way up? Well, I... It depends what you're talking about. If you're talking about the property market itself, yes. or whether you're talking about the economy upon which the property market is reliant, yes. there, there are two very different questions. Answer them both, briefly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, two minutes. 
<laughs> the, the economy is going to get worse. Mm -hmm. there, yep. There's no question about that. How worse and for how long is the question? The market, I think, is behind that. So I think the market's going to be not too bad until to the middle of next year. And as the economy it demonstrates how low it's going to go, then the market will follow it. Um, perhaps not as bad because at the end of the day, we're still very, very short of Housing. properties. Yeah, mm -hmm. and and that wh whoever's buying them, someone will buy them and someone will rent them out. But there, there's a demand for housing, so I'm more worried about the econ economy than about the property market. Very and I actually think you know we can we'll probably do quite well within the property market, even though the economy is is suffering and people are unemployed and and so on. So I think it depends what you're talking about. Yeah. But some, really, really people, well put. Yeah. some people are going to be losers, though, aren't they? Yeah, I exactly. mean, you know, sure. exactly. look how many claims there are for possessions of properties. I mean, yeah. I know loads of landlords that just haven't got the money and tenants yeah. are not paying. And I'm not talking about, you yeah, know... That could be homeowners that have lost their jobs. Uh, absolutely. It could be occasional landlords. So there are going to be, be losers. I think, I think the one... The, Where's the green shoot? Give me well, one I, hope of green shoot that I'm going to well, see I, to know, aha. We're nearly there. I always say that car sales relate to property sales. Okay. So when you see the car sales going back up, and they're very low at the moment, I know it's electric and it's, it's <laughs> not as easy. <laughs> it's not quite how it used to be, but car sales happen quicker than property. So when you see the car sales improving, when people are more confident about buying a new car and everything else, then property follows. Look at the auction market. Well, the auction market is 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 the best barometer of any property market because it happens quickly and first then the rest of the market follows the one thing i would also say here in defense of the property market is that sadly a lot of people are losing their jobs but are they the sort of people who are likely who were likely to buy a property next year or not and sadly they're not most of them are not the sort of people who would have bought a property next year anyway so I do think that there is an underlying strength in the UK property market because of low interest rates. But I'm cautious to be too optimistic because we've got to be responsible. Um, and if you listen to some commentators, they're, they're off the planet. Oh, it's going to be go up 10%. It's just bonkers. It's not going. That cannot happen. And I think it's uh, as professionals, as property summits, we're all professionals. And I think we have a responsibility to be give sensible professional advice. And that is, please be cautious next year. And okay. if I can lead on from that, it's picking your strategy very carefully. Exactly. What are you going to do now? Are you going to go and start um, an Airbnb short-term let model? I think you'd be pretty foolish to start that right now, in my opinion. Of Sorry, course, Paul. and I think we all agree with that. Um, Paul can comment on that in a moment. I'd love to hear his view. But, <laughs> um, you know, do we want to start a social housing um, yeah. block? And if that makes the numbers work and you can deliver some good quality, yeah. much needed accommodation to those move. people in need, that could be an excellent business strategy this coming couple of years. So it really depends what you want to do. So property business people, really, they've got to start thinking outside the box, haven't they? Yeah, and you've got to anticipate what's likely to happen. Yeah. Paul, last and word the, with you. I think the short-term lab business is, is, is a good example of, you know, when we made that business model, it was a good business model. And, and, and nobody really saw COVID coming. And, and we'll come out of it, you know, we'll make it work. But I suppose we'd, I, part of the reason we'll make it work is we're diversified enough that we're making money elsewhere. Um, so perhaps someone who's just started out with that's their only business, you know, would, would probably struggle to get through all of this, which, which goes to show regardless of how experienced or brilliant you are, um, sometimes it's just a bit of luck in business, you know, um, things go against you and things go for you. Um, but, you know, going back to what I was saying before about, about the longer term stuff, like, you know, we've had over the past 20 years, the average property price growth in the UK has been 5.5% per annum. Now that includes two recessions, three if you include the current one. Um, so even if you bought in 2007 before the credit crunch or in 1999 before the dot-com boom and, you know, literally the day before and then your property price went down the next day, it doesn't really matter so long as you're going to have it, if we're talking, we're talking buy to let, if you're going to have a tenant, you can service your costs and you can see through any bad period because, you know, longer term buy to let mortgages are, are very low risk. They're, they're cheap. You know, you, the rent usually more than covers them. Um, and therefore, so long as you can see at that period, 
you know, you're, you're, you're unlikely to run into too many issues. Thank you, Paul. So, unfortunately, we're out of time. But there you have it. You've heard it from the professionals themselves. There is optimism, but you've got to be cautious. Hold your nerve, keep your property, but make sure that you connect with the guys at Property Summit. From me, Marie Paris, I wish you a good day. Bye-bye. <laughs>